I would like to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Ali Azadi. He is Associate Professor of Neurology at the University of California, Irvine, and he recently moved from the East Coast. So uh, when he recently, I mean, within the last three weeks, so he was at uh, he was an assistant professor in the Department of Neurology at the Albert Einstein School of Medicine and at Montefiore Medical Center. He earned his medical degree from Shahid Beheshti University in Iran, and then did his postdoc research at Mass General Hospital and at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. He then did his internship and neurology residency at the Montefiore Medical Center and the Einstein College of Medicine. Now the next bit I'm going to read because I wanna make sure that I get it right when I'm talking about his research focus. So bear with me while I read this to you. Dr. Rizzotti's focus is on developing machine learning frameworks which can leverage big data from cohorts and trials to create accurate diagnostic and prognostic tools. Dr. Azadi's major contributions have been in the area of cognitive neuroscience, specifically in neuroepidemiology of aging and dementia, studying the relationship between Alzheimer's biomarkers, focusing on neuroimaging, Alzheimer's risk factors like depression, pain, and stress, and on cognitive function. Thank you again, Kelly, for the introduction. Uh, you you made my work for the first slide easy. This is my uh, track over the years. And as Kelly mentioned, I recently joined uh, University of California, Irvine. Uh, it has been a big change, but uh, it has been uh, made easy uh, through all the supports that I have had. Um, also, as Kelly mentioned uh, in her um, opening, we are... Uh, all somehow connected to Alzheimer's disease. And um, uh, the, the statistics tells, tells us that uh, one in two per person are directly uh, by first degree fam family is, is related to someone who has some sort of dementia these days. That is 50% of the population. And if we add the second degree families, I'm fairly sure that we will shoot up to upward of 90%. Um, so this is myself and my grandfather uh, in um, in Iran, Tehran, in 1985. And uh, my, my grandfather, the last couple of years of his life, which he lived in his 80s, late 80s, actually, um, he, 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 he wasn't really himself and didn't... Uh, I cannot say that he, he didn't recognize us per se, but he, he was disconnected from us for the most part. While he was a super active person um, uh, throughout his life and up, up until the last year or two. And uh, I'm, I'm talking about this retrospectively because at the time, I don't think that any of us realized what was going on with him. It was around 1990s, mid 1990s, I think. As a child, I, I absolutely had no idea. And I don't think that many people actually knew about uh, diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, especially. Yes, there was the concept of dementia all around the world, but especially at least in Iran, no one was able to um, accurately diagnose these diseases. And, and fast forward, uh, I don't know, like 25 years, 30 years, uh, when I was... Uh, I was in, in, in neurology residency and I was thinking backward, I realized that, well, now I'm learning about dementia and Alzheimer's disease, maybe my grandfather had these symptoms, you know, and, and I don't think that he was ever diagnosed with it or even anyone thought about it. But but um, now now uh, now we know a lot more about dementia and Alzheimer, and I'm glad that we live in this era. Uh, with that, I just want to also mention my disclosures here that I, my research is sponsored by many sources, including uh, Cure Alzheimer Fund, that I'm very thankful for it. Uh, Cure Alzheimer Fund actually was, I think, my joint second um, supporter through research. So I'm very, very grateful to them and also to you all for making that possible. So let's jump, jump into... Um, 
on, on, into our discussion. And I know that many of you are familiar with dementia and Alzheimer's disease, just an overview and uh, repeating basically uh, the, the uh, basic concepts of dementia. Uh, so, so dementia by itself is not a disease, but a, a collection of symptoms that is that includes like that has decline in memory, reasoning, communication skills, ability of doing day-to-day -day tasks. Uh, these symptoms, this collection of symptoms are caused by diseases. And the most common type of that is Alzheimer's disease, followed by vascular dementia, Lewy body disease and frontotemporal dementia. And these are considered different pathologic diseases with different causes and potentially different therapies. What I would like to highlight, because it is particularly important also for this talk and, uh, and in general knowing that, is that more than 50% of people who have dementia have a mix of these pathology. It is, it is rarely actually like especially in older people in, in 80 plus or 90 plus, especially, it is very, very rare that you can find a person that has only one of these pathologies. It is, it is usually a mix of these pathologies. But uh, Alzheimer from this family of dementia have, gets a lot of attention because of obviously its prevalence, its highest prevalence and its highest contribution to the mixed pathology that I mentioned. So what is Alzheimer's disease? Uh, essentially, the way that we describe Alzheimer's disease these days is based on these three pathologic findings that you can see below. Uh, the brain, as we, uh, in, in those who have Alzheimer's disease, will go under pathologic changes. The main changes that we observe, and they are not necessarily the causes of disease, the, the ones that we observe are uh, accumulation of amyloid beta, um, or what we call A-beta, uh, also an accumulation of tau proteins. These are proteins that, that accumulates in the cells and damages the cells essentially. And also what we call neurodegeneration under the umbrella of neurodegeneration, which is essentially losing the cells. Cells die, brain goes under the process of atrophy and we lose also the connections between the cells. And that causes for, for brain to shrink and, and get smaller. Uh, through this pathologic process. And what I want to highlight here, again, this is important for the rest of the talk, is that for, for many, many years, we, uh, we didn't have the technology to differentiate Alzheimer's from other causes of uh, dementia. Uh, MRIs became available, widely available in 1990s. Uh, and that's when we started to to, to be able to um, assess neurodegeneration. PET scans for amyloid beta were, became widely available in 2000s, between 2000 to 2010. And then tau imaging became available just a mere 10, 15 years ago, after 2010, actually. So we were not able to measure any of these up until 15 years ago. And that is a huge uh, deal actually for for research and and that that has probably hindered research in this area for many years. But thankfully now we have MRIs, PET scans, and again because of advanced te technology we can measure many of these measures, including tau and amyloid, in the blood or CSF, uh, cerebral cerebrospinal fluid of people with with uh, great accuracy. But okay, so uh, that being said, let me get get to two of my favorite slides, um, basically. Uh, why Alzheimer's is such a big deal and such a big problem in the world right now. Uh, the first reason basically is that uh, you can see here that uh, this is the uh, graph of life expectancy from uh, 1700s to a couple of years ago. And as you can see, our life expectancy as a, hu a human beings overall in all continents, like our life expectancy was 35 years total for many, many years, you know. Uh, and and uh, with, with improvement in healthcare and living conditions around 1850s, we started to, to see an increase in the life expectancy of people. Uh, to the extent that if you if you do that do the math here, you will see that uh, 
for every four years that we live from 18, 18, 1850 to 2020, we gain we gain one year. So you live four year, gain one, one, one year. As one of my colleagues was uh, summarizing this, uh, you live a week, you gain a weekend. Uh, so, so as you can see, with the exception of, with a few exceptions, this is this uh, drop is the uh, uh, cardiovascular disease endemic endemic that was going around. This uh, drop again is the the COVID uh, pandemic that has been going around. But with with the with, with a few exceptions, we have been seeing that life expectancy going on uh, going up uh, significantly over the last few uh, over the last two hundred years almost. Uh, so uh, let's put that beside. This graph, which is the prevalence of dementia and Alzheimer's disease in, uh, in, in, in humans. And as you can see, the prevalence of uh, dementia is substantially uh, going up in older age, essentially doubling every five years to the extent that people who live into their 90s, 95, 100, 50% of them will have dementia um, at, 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 at the age of 100. Uh, so, so if you look at these two graphs, you will see some, some, some similarities that, that essentially the pandemic of uh, dementia is happening because of uh, population growing in all continents. Uh, so when you look at these graphs uh, from far apart, you might think that aging by itself is the cause for dementia becoming a global healthcare problem. But we have to differentiate primary or healthy aging from secondary or pathologic aging. So the primary aging is age-related changes that are intrinsic and universal and happens to everyone at some point in their life if they live long enough. But secondary aging is, is basically pathologic aging when age-related changes are, are happening because of accumulation of risk factors and disease pathology by itself. So let, let me give you some examples. Uh, for for uh, for healthy aging, we have altered sleep patterns. Uh, but for pathologic aging, it is insomnia because of uh, need to go to bathroom, having pain, being depressed. Um, impaired glucose tolerance happens in everyone when when people get older. But diabetes happens only a sub, in in a subpopulation. Same with disease, decreased bone mass, uh, bone mass that that everyone experiences in their in their older age. But some people will have osteoporosis, declining in inte intellectual function, uh, general abilities again happens with aging. But Alzheimer's disease happens on only in a portion of people. And finally, again, gait and balance problems only happens. Uh, the gait and balance problems are, are, are common in older age, but but they are particularly pathologic in, in Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, or other neurodegenerative disease in general. So what is the solution to, to the increased uh, pathology, path, pathologic aging? Uh, as you know, uh, we can we have we have some some options, some general options, which is to prevent prevent them from happening, or when they happen to come up with treatments to, to treat them. Uh, and we have tried, we have tried a lot for Alzheimer's disease, and but we have not been very successful. And this graph is going to show that to you. Uh, so you can see that throughout history, essentially we have a total of six drugs approved by FDA for Alzheimer's disease, two of them in the last two years. So that's great news for the Alzheimer community. But in this span of 20 years that you can see, we ran more than 500 trials, different drugs, different populations, uh, different implementations, and all of them failed. So, and to put that in perspective, uh, one in 10 clinical trials that are that that we are running as as, as scientists in 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 
in, in medicine, one in 10 of them leads to a, an approved drug by FDA. But we ran 500 trials for Alzheimer and none of them were approved for 20 years. So, so uh, essentially drug development for Alzheimer has been very, very challenging. And uh, here's the reason for that. The process for creating these drugs is very cumbersome and very costly. Uh, they, the, on average, uh, a single Alzheimer drug it takes 13 years to, to produce it and get it to clinical trial stage, to the phase three clinical trial stage, which you can see its steps here. And clinical trial by itself is, is taking longer and longer these days because of recruitment problems and cost issues. And, and also like this whole process is, is costing on average $6 billion. So you can imagine that uh, a lot of money has been poured into the into this field. However, it, it was not really successful because of the challenges that we have. But what are those challenges that we have? And I'm going to only focus on on, on the last part, the clinical part of it for, um, for, for the sake of time here. So there are three major reasons that development of drugs have failed in Alzheimer in Alzheimer world. Uh, first one being the drug re related problems and uh, which which to summarize it like it is essentially like we have we have chosen the wrong target. For, for the drug, so maybe we have been uh, we have been focusing on a specific pathology for too long, and uh, the drug that we we, uh, we we gave to people was was the wrong drug. Basically, we we might have run trials that the drug was right, but the dosing of the drug was wrong, or the drug was effective, but it had so much side effects. It caused so much side effects in people that that we just ab abandoned the drug. Uh, there are many problems with the tr uh, with, with design of trials and running the trials by themselves, which could be enrolling people who who do not have that pathology. Remember that uh, PET scans uh, became widely available over the last two decades. So so many of the early studies in 2000s and even in early 2010s, the, we didn't have confirmation of. Uh, Alzheimer's disease in people when we were giving them drugs. So we had a mix of people with mixed pathology and we were giving the drug to the wrong population. Uh, and, uh, and also we have, we have some other issues with enrollment of participants with measurement of cognition and uh, functional ability of people throughout time. Uh, which which I'm not going to into details with them. And finally, there are, there are a lot of logistical problems, which I mentioned the cost, there is significant recruitment issues. Um, in fact, uh, in fact, the longest period during a, during development of a drug, the longest thing that that will hinder progress of uh, projects is recruitment. And I know so many projects or, uh, even trials that have been aband abandoned uh, midway because of inability to recruit participants. Uh, and finally, uh, because many of these trials takes years to run, three years to five years, for example, it is very hard for patients or even caregivers to 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 bring them to the to the clinical trial centers to 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 engage in the studies. So. I talked a lot um, uh, till, till now about the background and, and the challenges that we have with uh, in, in the Alzheimer ward and in clinical research of Alzheimer ward. But now I'm going to switch uh, a little bit here, the gears toward the research that myself and my lab ha has been doing over the last few years. And that is how artificial intelligence and big data can help with Alzheimer research. And, and uh, to start with, I have to say that now, especially with uh, chat GPT coming out and other models that, that have recently come out, I think uh, there has been a, a huge um, amount of information out there about artificial intelligence. And, 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 and I think like many people's attention have been grabbed into this field uh, rather than being anything new because, because if you think about artificial intelligence, uh, I'm fairly sure that all of us have been using uh, weather predictions, which is some sort of artificial, artificial intelligence model. 
We have been all using Google Maps. We have been all using Expedia to book our flights or hotels, and we have been all using Amazon to buy stuff. So, so the concept of AI and and using it in day to day activities or for for things that we we really need help um, is is nothing new, but that concept is certainly new to healthcare and very challenging in healthcare. Um, and the challenges, we can discuss it at another time or, or maybe later at the Q&A um, um, time that we have. But, but what is common between all of these tools that you can see is that they are built using big amount of data. So meaning that like millions of people have traveled on, on the roads and Google is using that data to give us the estimate of arrival time for us. Uh, millions of people have been buying uh, stuff on Amazon, and that's why when you search something, it will give you um, items that you might be interested in. The same goes with the same goes with hotels and uh, flights and everything else. Uh, but in medicine, because of many things, including well, sample size, our sample size, we are talking about millions for Google Map, but most. Clinical studies are in the order of a hundred people, a few hundred people, or a few thousand people. Uh, we are talking about again millions or maybe billions of people in Amazon, and then uh, the amount of MRIs or PET scans that we have from patients in the is in the order of thousands. Even if we accumulate everything around the world, which is not possible because of local um, local human protection law laws. IRBs or HIPAA compliance issues, um, we, we will end up with only uh, maybe hundreds of thousands of data, which is significantly lower than uh, what our um, what, pe what people uh, in, in tech have. Uh, so, so essentially, uh, we have the big data. We are getting more and more data these days, thankfully, due to, uh, due to uh, advancement in technology. But, but uh, we have to come up with solutions to to translate that data to to real practice for medicine. So uh, this is how we are trying to achieve it. And uh, by by uh, we, I mean everyone who is active in the in the uh, space of AI in healthcare. Uh, you can see that we we collect large data sets from hundreds, thousands of people. And these data sets are becoming bigger and bigger because uh, with the advancement of technology, variable technology, imaging technology, genetics, and other omics data, and also many of the um, computer-based, tablet-based, smartphone-based uh, data collection platforms, we are having millions of data for each person. So then we, we apply uh, some mathematical models, uh, which with which it's it, their ex extension would be statistical models, machine learning, or art artificial intelligence to solve problems that are in diagnostic, prognostic, prediction, and prognosis of diseases, and also uh, identifying treatments. So uh, this is a lot of like talking from thirty thousand feet above and not much specifics. But let me give you some examples of how. Um, AI can be helpful in Alzheimer's disease. So for diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. So as I mentioned, there are many subtypes of dementia. So uh, it, it becomes sometimes challenging for clinicians and uh, researchers to differentiate between these diseases. AI uh, and, and different statistical models can help with uh, accurate diagnosis of people. It can also help with identifying the stages of disease. Do, are they Are they uh, full, uh, uh, do they have full-blown dementia or they are in the mild uh, cognitive impairment stage? Uh, AI models can help also with prognosis. The first question that everyone who comes to clinic is that, uh, doctor, how, 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 how long do I have before I, I lose my mind? And, and uh, the, the, the reality is that as a clinician, I usually say, I don't know, you know, but 
but models can help us uh, because they can rely on the information from other patients, from, um, from many people uh, that have lived before with the same condition in the same situations and, and give us, give us a, a good prognosis. Uh, it also can help us with prediction, uh, prediction of next stages of diagnostics, prediction of um, how fast someone is going to decline uh, to, to the full-blown uh, dementia. Uh, it can help with, with the decision-making of physicians. A lot of time physicians struggle, which would be the best next step for patients? Should I send this patient with limited resources or limited uh, insurance coverage for PET scan or CSF studies or for other purposes? So here is where, again, uh, artificial intelligence models can help. And finally, uh, once we have treatments, not every treatment is going to work for everyone. So at that time, uh, we have to figure out which medication is a good match for each person uh, who is coming to the clinics. And that, that is there again, because artificial intelligence, big data and experiences from previous uh, patients can help us. These modeling approaches can help us identify a good match for an, a good person. And that is the promise of what everyone calls individualized medicine or precision me medicine these days. So, uh, now I'm going to move a little bit to more specifics of the uh, to more of the specifics of our own work. And again, I am going to uh, give you a very broad overview of what we have been doing. Uh, and I have the I have the uh, references on the slides, and I will be happy to share the original articles with everyone here. Uh, after that, and it will be, I think, on the on the website, so that people can go and read them, um, review them in 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 detail. So, so here is one uh, the first example of how um, we used artificial intelligence models and ma machine learning models essentially to improve clinical diagnostic in Alzheimer's disease. So here is the problem that we have: uh, cognitive impairment in is on is underdiagnosed in in general population. And in fact, 50% of people who have mild cognitive impairment or dementia are living in the world without a diagnosis of dementia. Um, and that, numbers, that number might, might sound um, strange, but, but that is just the reality. It is just because of limited access to healthcare in many parts of the world, or even in the US in rural suburban areas. The diagnostic challenges and also the stigma and denial uh, of people. People are uh, afraid of going to doctors, and even if they have mild cognitive impairment, they are uh, they, they are being called like demented by by family, friends, or or even by themselves thinking about uh, it that, in that way. So, and, and the other factor is obviously lack of awareness. Someone who has uh, cognitive impairment does not have the awareness to go and seek help from, from doctors. So how can AI help? This is a major problem. How can AI help? So we, we thought that we can uh, identify individuals who are at risk and help with the screening of those people based on information that is already available because of other visits of patients. So let's imagine that someone goes to a doctor and for whatever reason, they have headache or any other problem, they get an MRI from their brain. And that information is now available in the medical system for, for any purposes. So if patients agree to share that data, we can, we can run models, applications on, on, on that imaging or blood tests that they're, they're running and, and identify those individuals who are at higher risk of dementia or identify those who definitely have dementia. Maybe we can even do that. So that is exactly what we did in one of our studies. We used data from uh, one of the largest uh, cohorts of aging and, de and dementia, which is named ADNI. Uh, and, and we used uh, data that has been already collected from normals and those who have Alzheimer's disease. And we trained machine learning models to differentiate these two participants from each other. These two different types of participants from each other. And uh, what we used 
to differentiate these people was only their MRI data. Uh, basically, we fed the MRI images to, to the machine learning models and tried to differentiate normals from Alzheimer. And the outcome is, is, is really, really great, actually. So only using MRI, you can get uh, about 95% sensitivity and 80% specificity for diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. So uh, you can diagnose nine out of 10, approximately, people who have Alzheimer's disease only using their MRIs. If you add other, other information to this, this number is definitely going up. So what is the real world application of it? Uh, machine learning models, these models can be implemented in electronic health records or, or other applications. And, and once people release their data, their personal information into these apps, it can give them um, either diagnosis or, or a percentage for, for probability of developing um, a certain diagnosis, uh, which, which in our case was Alzheimer's disease. So this is the second example. Uh, and here we used uh, machine learning models to, to, uh, to improve um, pathologic diagno diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so as I mentioned in, in my first slide, one of the pathologic findings in the brain of people who live with, with Alzheimer's disease uh, is amyloid. Uh, and uh, but, but the challenge is that 30% of people who are normal and like 30% of us probably sitting here, they are uh, they, they have they have amyloid in their brain. Uh, so even in younger age, like in, in 40s and 50s, like 10, 10 to 20 percent of people have amyloid in, in their brain. So we don't want to uh, give them. Uh, give everyone uh, a drug, obviously, that is working on amyloid because not everyone has it. So we have to confirm presence of amyloid in their brain with PET scans. So we have to obtain 10 PET scans from 10 people who are walking outside and are above the age of 65 so that three of them are amyloid positive and we enroll them in a trial or we give them a, a, a specific drug for that that, that is targeting um, amyloid. And as you can imagine, this is not cost benefit really, um, because seven of those PET scans, which roughly cost $5,000 right now, is, uh, is, is a waste of money. So what we thought was that what if before obtaining PET scans from people, we can use available information that people have to, to identify those who, who have amyloid in their brain, and then only those who are more likely to have amyloid go on their PET scan. So that is exactly what we did using data from a clinical trial. This clinical trial is, data, and this clinical trial is named A4. And that trial, what they did was that essentially they they got uh, PET scans from almost 4,500 people to find 1,000 people who are amyloid positive. Uh, so essentially 67% of the, the, the um, PET scans that they, they, they got was useless or, or it wasted their money. Uh, but this data was already available to us, so information from the past. We fed that information to machine learning models to differentiate uh, these two outcomes for us. And <clears throat> what we found was that uh, you can use uh, very basic information, essentially. Uh, age, uh, one of the genetic risk scores, which is called APOE4, and uh, also a couple of cognitive questionnaires uh, that that it is easily ad, uh, easily administered by um, one of the providers. It could be a doctor or a neuropsychologist or even uh, even um, an, a nurse or an aide, and and only with these four or five information you can you can you can identify those who are more likely to be amyloid positive. We converted that to a tool, which is an app essentially that anyone can go online. And, and use it, enter the name, 
uh, and enter the age um, if if they have uh, they have ApoE4 genes or not, and also enter information about the, their cognitive tests. And once you enter that, this will give us a risky score or the probability of having amyloid in their brain. So based on the calculations that we did, just using this simple model, this simple calculator, we can decrease the number of people that we need to test from 10 to five. And with, with imaging only five people, we can find three people who are uh, amyloid positive. That decreases the number of people that need to be screened for a trial by 50%. That also decreases the number of people that a clinician uh, suggests them to go to get PET scans for starting a treatment by 50%. And that, that is a huge amount of saving, cost saving essentially for uh, for both trials and, and in real world, for both for the patients if they're paying out of pocket and also for insurances. The last example that I am going to show you uh, is how we can use um, uh, AI to, to improve prognostics in, in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and again, the challenge is that uh, the, the problem that, that we see every day in practice is that patients, caregivers would like to know how, how much time they have, uh, how, how they should plan for their life. Uh, resources are limited, so we cannot do everything for everyone. We cannot get MRIs from everyone who is above the age of 65. We cannot get different types of pets for everyone who is above the age of 65. And, and also the rate of cognitive decline varies from 1% to 1%. So, so for someone, it might be like they, they might develop full-blown Alzheimer's in two years. And for some people, it might take 20 years and they don't develop full-blown Alzheimer's. So, so you want to allocate your resources to the people who are declining faster and they will, they will get to the uh, disabled uh, status sooner. So how can, um, uh, again, machine learning models help here? Uh, it, it, they can help with uh, essentially uh, risk assessment and, and uh, basically um, predicting uh, disease progression patterns for us. Uh, it can use historically collected data from thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people to, 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 to learn uh, what is the disease progression patterns and what is the treatment response in those people? And then it can feed that by feed feed that information back to us um, on how to how to use that for a patient in uh, who who is sitting right now in front of us in a clinic. So uh, again, the design of a study was was somewhat similar to to what I've showed you before. We have we used data from two different clinical trials already concluded. These this trial um, already failed actually, unfortunately. Uh, the results came out um, a couple of years ago. Um, but we can use the information that was collected as part of this trial. Uh, in, in this trial, there were many people that during two, three, two and a half years of trial, they did not decline. They remained stable throughout the study. And there were some people, almost 50% of them, that showed disease decline uh, or disease progression during the course of trial, during that two years of trial. So, so we trained our models to differentiate these two types of people from each other. And when we applied it prospectively, we we figured out that we can uh, we can identify uh, those who are likely to decline or uh, or show disease progression uh, uh, with, with 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 an accuracy of around seventy uh, percent, which is around twenty percent better than when the time when we are not using any any artificial intelligence model or or we are just guessing you know we are enrolling everyone in a trial or we are giving a drug to everyone so uh, if we want to narrow down our pool of subjects for a trial or pool of patients that we want to give them treatment it is beneficial to run these models based on the data of those patients or those participants in their trials, and and then um, then make decisions based on the outcome of these models. 
So going to conclude here, I know that I've been running um, out of time for a few minutes already, uh, but going to con conclude here uh, that uh, our uh, population is aging and uh, disease prevalence, especially neurodegenerative disease uh, prevalence is, is increasing uh, and they are becoming um, global healthcare problems. Uh, technological advancement uh, has led us to collecting a substantial amount of data from everyone who comes to clinics, who goes to research studies, and, and it has been a challenge to use that information and translate that information to practical, uh, to practical ways that will change our decision-making process, both for patients and also for clinicians. Uh, artificial intelligence model have the potential to change that, there are significant barriers along the way, uh, but but I'm very optimistic that um, that we will get to a place that uh, Google and Microsoft and other tech are already in for our day-to-day -day activities, and 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 we will we will get that uh, get there with, with, with our healthcare um, um, issues too, and and we will find solutions through these methods, uh, and. With that, I would like to thank you and also thank my uh, collaborators across US and also my sponsors again. Thank you uh, to all of you.